Hey everyone, we are live with the inaugural episode of Poker Uncensored here. Um, I'm your host, Matt Solon, and I'm just going to give you guys a quick little introduction about me. So um, I am a t- tournament-focused poker player, and my most recent uh, play was at the Borgata, sorry, my most recent play was at the MGM Poker Room, where I final tabled the 100k guaranteed. Next up for me will be at the Borgata. I've lived in four different states, Maryland, Massachusetts, Wisconsin, and now New Hampshire. My day job is working as a technical delivery lead focused on Salesforce. And I recently launched a poker community and podcast to give people a chance to talk about poker and have the freedom to go speak their opinions about it. Um, So tonight's podcast, we've got a great guest for you all. Um, So he is currently working for the World Poker Tour, and his name is Keith. He lives in Hollywood, California, and he's been a part of the film industry for over 30 years. He started playing poker back in 1994. So that's for those who, uh, who are keeping track, that's more than more than 20 years ago. And he was a winner for multiple years and he's worked 10 seasons with the world poker tour. And he's got a wild story from the 2005 world series of poker that we're going to get into. So, um, Keith, if you want to go ahead and kind of talk us through that. So how did you, I guess first, how did you get into poker? What started you out in in poker? All right. Well, I I moved to Los Angeles from North Carolina. I was working in the film industry in North Carolina, and uh, I moved to Hollywood in 1994, right after the earthquake. And what happened was a, a couple guys took me to the Commerce Casino, and back then, literally, it was low limit stud and low limit uh hold'em and you know I, I i had some gambling history background just you know i i've i've shot pool for money i play golf you know playing skins I've, I've always had a and i've always played cards of some sort but here was like legitimate casino poker and the first night i hit four of a kind busted somebody and it, it, I've been hooked ever since. And it was just like the sucker showed up, got lucky and he was coming back. So that's, that was my introduction to casino poker. So that's, that's interesting. So you had a, a fun introduction to poker where you basically kind of came in the first time you played, you won. I'll tell you my first poker experience was the complete opposite. I, I went into Atlantic city I bought into a one, two game for I think a hundred dollars and I lasted all of three hands before my top pair was no good against, uh, I think, two pair and uh, proceeded to basically exit the poker room and decided to try my luck at blackjack instead. Uh, <laughs> it took me another couple of years to jump back into things and actually start to uh, play poker again. So a little later in in your time playing poker. So you decided to, to move on up and go play the world series, basically to go play the main event. And uh, I think this was 2005, correct? Correct. And so how did you, how'd you get to the main event? Cause that's kind of a jump from just your first time at commerce to deciding, you know what, now I'm going to take a shot at the, the biggest um, event in poker. All right. Well, it's a long sorted tale. Uh, just give me a few minutes here. It's kind of interesting because, I moved out to Hollywood. I was uh, riding a motorcycle in LA and uh, December 13th, Friday, the 13th, 1994, I got T-boned or I T-boned a car that was turning left in front of me. I broke my arm. I went over the car. I woke up in the hospital saying what happened. Um, and my, I, I was in the hospital for a couple of days. My girlfriend was actually moving to Las Vegas she was going to go to UNLV to be an accountant. And my I couldn't do my job as a movie grip. I did lighting. I did camera work. I did all sorts of things as crew work. I tried being an actor for several years, but, it, you know, you only get a couple of days here and there. As crew, you work for three, four months. You get the whole show. So uh, I was doing crew work, and I couldn't do crew work with a broken arm and broken ribs. And uh, she said, if you come help me move to Vegas – uh, I will help you get on your feet till you can work again. And I thought that was a wonderful idea. So we packed, I, you know, I was carrying a couch with one arm saying, don't you have any friends? We moved to Las Vegas. Now I couldn't work. And I, I was basically, you know, sitting around all day. So 
I was running around to places. I was asking everybody, how do you, how do you beat the casino? How do you win? How do you, what's the system? I figured the locals would know. And everybody laughed at me. A couple of them pulled me aside, said, you got to learn poker. Now, I kept saying, well, you better teach me. One of them was uh, the one of them was a uh, floor man. He ran the uh, oh god. One of them worked at Sahara, and another one worked at uh, oh god, my brain just stopped. A really shithole casino that's not even uh, it's barely a casino now. It it was where Tupac got shot across the street at Coble and uh, Lamingo. It'll come to me in a minute. So anyway, I is that go- where um, I, I can't, is that where like the Hooters casino is now or is no, that around? No, no, Ho- no. Hooters is up on Hooters is up on Tropicana. No, no, it's South. It, it's, it, it'll come to me in a minute, but uh, his father ran the casino from the poker room. He had two phones on the, on the table. He had a 25, uh, $2,500 pot limit game uh, in the casino and uh, Jim Barnes ran the casino. My friend Pat Barnes ran the poker room and Jim Barnes would have people like Puggy Pearson, the old school big time players. They'd come in, they'd have $5,000 bundled up in $100 bills. They'd throw a bunch of them on the table and they would play. And it was crazy. And I would watch this and I was just fascinated with it because I saw it the Amarillo Slims, I saw them all come in trying to pick off Jim Barnes. And Jim Barnes would be screaming in the phone, fire that guy. And I said, raise. And he'd be in the casino playing poker all day running the casinos. It was amazing. It was wild. Um, so I, I would sit behind my friend Pat. We would go to the Mirage. Now, if you ever watch a movie, Rounders, at the end of the movie – Matt Damon character is going to Las Vegas to play in the world series of poker and at the Mirage because the Mirage was the place to play. It was the number one poker room. It was the biggest, it was the best, had the biggest games. Um, you know, it was the Aria right now or, you know, what Bellagio was and the Mirage had, it was all limit though. This is back in the mid nineties. It was limit poker. Rarely could you find a no limit poker unless it was a tournament. So, and uh, and, back in, uh, and back in that time, the Mirage was a relatively, I think, new place. Right back in the the uh, yeah, early nineties, it was a few years old, but uh, uh, the Mirage was the place to play. So I would go sit behind him. He was he was playing ten twenty limit. And there was a bigger game, 20, 40, and sometimes even 100, 200 limit, but it was all limit. And I, w- I would sit behind him playing 10, 20. Now, the funny thing is that somebody would raise, he'd look down, he'd show me ace, jack, and he'd muck it. And it was just no second thought. It's just in the muck. One, one raise, you know, the minimal raise you can do, and uh, he would just muck it. And it was just the way they played. They played really tight. You know, there was a philosophy, no set, no bet. I mean, they didn't really follow that, but it was it, it was a much tighter game. Uh, when somebody turned over a hand in these bigger games, they had something. Rarely was somebody just ramming and jamming and bluffing. And that's why Stewie Younger did so well was later on when the Internet came on and people found out you could just ram and jam people off hands. Uh, Stewie was doing that in the 80s. And nobody, you know. You had to have a hand to stand up against them or be willing to go broke. Uh, but Stewie was just running over people left and right because of that, because everybody was playing uber, super conservative tight. So I got my start playing regularly in Vegas for a couple of years. I lived there for a couple of years. I also worked in the film industry. I did a lot of TV commercials. I, I worked as a stagehand. I worked both Tyson Holyfield fights. Those were the craziest events I've ever seen. People are in the fights in the stands. It looked like a Mexican soccer match without the flares. I mean, nachos, beer, everything flying, fists flying. People were trying to get at Tyson as he's walking out. And, he was and trying that's to the get one. Crowd. That's the one where uh, was this where I think Mike Tyson bit the guy's ear, right? The se- the second one. The first one. Holyfield was like a 30 to one underdog. So all the small money, if you had a hundred bucks, you're putting it on Holyfield. 
if you put a, you know, if, if, if you put 30 bucks on, on Holyfield, you know, you're going to win $900. It's just so all the small money was on Holyfield. So by the third or fourth round, people are going, hey, Holyfield's got a chance here. And all of a sudden the crowd's like, Holyfield, holy. And Tyson's, you know, looking at the crowd going, where's my fans? Well, everybody was his fan. They just didn't have the money to bet on him. So the second – he ends up losing that fight. So the second fight opened at like 5-1 to one and closed at 3-1, to one, uh, Tyson. And they figured Tyson showing up for this one just going to kill him. But they gave Holyfield a lot more respect. And uh, sixth or seventh round, Tyson bit his ear off. And pandemonium happened inside the MGM. I, anyway, I worked those. I, I was living there then. I, I was playing poker a lot. At that time – I would play poker all day and then go work a show at night because I was also doing uh, stage shows. Uh, Miss Darren opened. I, I did uh, I did different shows around Las Vegas. So I played poker in the daytime for three, four hours, and I would go work four or five hours at night. It was wonderful. And I, I, got, a, I got, you know, well into the poker world, learning how to play from these professionals. I go watch at the Mirage and a few other places. So after, after all of your, your time essentially learning in Vegas, you decided you're going to take a shot at the WSOP. Um, and so you had it, or you were already in Vegas and you signed up for the tournament. And then this is where your story gets wild, right? So you, ha- you actually never made it to the tournament. Yeah, well, let me fast forward, fast backwards a little bit. In 97, in, in 97, I moved back to L.A., uh, and I would still go to Vegas a lot and work there, but I, I work in the film industry in L.A. I was doing really well. I worked in some of the biggest movies in the world, and I would get done with movies, and I'd go play poker for, you know, two, three months, and then go back working on the movie. I started making more money playing poker than I was working in the film industry on biggest feature films in the world. Um, I mean, I've worked on Forrest Gump. I worked 2001. I worked on Planet of the Apes with Marky Mark Wahlberg. Went straight to Spider-Man 1 with uh, uh, Tobey Maguire, right? Left one, walked on the set of another. I mean, I worked on the biggest movies in the world, but I would get done working on a movie and I would go play poker for two, three months and I'd make 20 grand playing poker. And then the, the boom hit 2002, 2003, uh, the moneymaker boom. I found online poker uh, about 2003, right after moneymaker one, I found online poker. So I was playing in the casinos a lot. I was putting in probably, a thousand hours plus a year at that time. And I was booking winning year after winning year, making anywhere 20, 30, 40 bucks an hour for the entire year for several years in a row. But uh, <clears throat> in 2005, I was on Poker Stars. I, I bought into a satellite real early, too, like one of the first satellites I had for the World Series of Poker main event. And I won it. So I won a seat early. Now, at this time, I, I had my own production company, and I was trying to promote myself, and I was trying to promote myself with poker. I wanted to make poker videos. Uh, I, was, I was shooting independent movies on my own. And what happened was, I, back then, for the younger generation, there was a, a website called MySpace. First, it was Friendster. You could only have... Uh, I think a couple hundred friends. And the moment you had got 200 friends, you, you were kicked off and you start over. So everybody moved to a site called MySpace. Well, MySpace was rocking and rolling back then. As a matter of fact, MySpace was, if you, if you joined your join number was literally the, the next number. And there was over 750 million profiles created before it collapsed in 2009. I mean, it literally just disappeared in a year. It went from the biggest site in the world to gone. Facebook just crushed it, took it over, which right. I, and- I've, I've never understood that. But on MySpace, I had a poker group. What I didn't realize, I wasn't even paying attention, was I had the second largest poker group on MySpace. I had four or 5,000 people in it. And 
What I didn't know was a bunch of people from 2 Plus 2, the website, there's a topic called Oot, Other Other Topics. Well, Oot has a history of some real degenerates coming in there for something other than poker. And what they would do is they would get on a thread and they would say, hey, let's go mess with somebody. Well, guess what? They chose me. Ooters, the Ootiots, came over and started messing with my MySpace group, and they were asking the dumbest questions over and over, like, what's the best sunglasses to wear? And, and then they would all chime in, and, and they would just run havoc all over the, the web, the, the group. And uh, they, they were trashing me. They, they, you know, they're trolls, big yeah, time and, trolls. I mean, and you know what? It's trolls. <laughs> It's wild that, that you know you talk about having trolls over a decade ago because I have to deal with a lot of trolls left and right. I started a new poker community for folks in the Northeast to be able to talk about poker. And within the first week, you had trolls jumping in and trying to derail stuff, take it off topic, um, start chiming around with insults and stuff. But it looks like you know the problem of people trolling in the poker community probably goes back to when the internet first started talking about poker. Yes. Well, here, here was my dilemma. I had won a seat. I posted in my group, hey, I won a seat, right? And I posted a picture of the tournament and, and everything, you know, the results page and all that. Somebody stole my identity and was trying to sell my seat or pieces. And come to find out, it was trolls from 2 plus 2. So I did... You know, I, I don't put up with a lot of crap. So you know what I did? I shut down the second biggest group on MySpace. Just shut it down. Said, I, this one's over. Kill it. I don't need this. I don't need this aggravation. I don't need these trolls. You know, I, I'm a successful person. I make a lot of money. I work in the film industry. I travel the world. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't need to put up with this shit. I'm not trying to get famous. I just don't need this headache. Yeah. So I shut the, I shut the site down for like two weeks before I was supposed to go play in Vegas. Wow. So I went, I, I went to see now on my own profile page on, on my space, you know, obviously I'm posting, Hey, I'm going to Vegas. I'm going to go do this. And, uh, uh, I'm going to go, uh, play in the world series of poker. Now here's a crazy thing. In 1995, I lived in a condominium on Wynn Avenue. Or Bull it's right, it's right behind the Gold Coast. It is uh, uh, Mississippi Avenue, like two blocks behind the Gold Coast, and just a little a part, uh, condo complex. And and uh, I, I lived in a condo there. So I would go play poker almost daily, either at the Rio or the Gold Coast. And then in, I think it was 96, uh, the Gold Coast closed its poker room because the Orleans opened. And the Orleans took over their poker room. Uh, but I played at the Rio all the time because that's where all the tourists came. There's people not from Las Vegas that didn't know how to play poker. I was killing it there. I made a lot of money in that poker room. And then in 2005, it was the first year they were doing uh poker at the rio now up till then it always been at the horseshoe and i used to go to the horseshoe and watch a world series of poker i wouldn't play i i really didn't i i wasn't that comfortable with no limit yet because it still wasn't around a whole lot it was coming in all the casinos they all spread it now but there weren't a lot of people who were quote quote no limit professionals in the casinos Right. And that's uh, the big difference from from back then compared to say today. Today, you go into a casino and uh, you know you might have twelve tables of no limit running, and there's like one table of of limit. And for those of us who are on the the younger side, when we look at the note, the sorry, when we look at the limit table, it tends to be folks who are a little bit um, uh, older there that are sitting there. Yeah. But we do have one question that came in from um, Mr. Uh, Alexander Lacoste, and he said. What's a troll? So we were talking a little bit about about internet trolls, and well, if you look at the definition, basically it's saying a troll is somebody who basically tries to upset people on the internet to distract and so discord by posting stuff that's inflammatory, off topic, or digressive. Um, and so that's what a troll is. I mean, I think they uh, they, 
they came to my group in mass from two plus two to ruin my group. And they did everything in their power to piss off everybody and upset and, and just be complete nuisance. And they did it. Wow. But it, wa it wasn't until somebody actually was selling my seat. It, somebody online was selling my seat. And come to find out they were from the two plus two group, these idiots. And uh, I believe his, his screen name was Tech, T-E-K. I found out who it was later. But uh, this guy Tech was trying to sell my, I, you know, I don't even want to say that because it may not, might might be wrong but i'm pretty sure it was tech there's still records of it where wow. he admitted he did it All um, right. now so so I back to so, um... i was so excited i was so excited the world series was coming to the rio i was living in la i was working in the film industry everything's going wonderful i'm going to the rio to play in the world series poker main event i want to see i was very excited so i show up i've got my pickup truck I've got my Harley in the back of a pickup truck. I ride a motorcycle. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I would consider myself a biker slash motorcycle enthusiast, which means I ride. I ride a lot. I've always ridden a lot. I've always ridden Harleys. Uh, I like wearing black leather vests and chain wallets. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't take no lip off no bartender sometimes. So it gets me in trouble. But. You know, I'm very loyal. I'm very dedicated to people I love. And, uh, you know, I don't have to break the law because I got everything I need at that moment. So uh, I show up. Now, I'm, I brought my motorcycle up there because of parking at the Rio. I wanted to be able to park right up near the door. What it, I didn't think it through was it was 115 degrees. <laughs> it's July. July 7th, 2005. Uh it's 115 degrees. I ride my motorcycle to the Rio. I sign in. Uh, I leave the Rio. I got I got like a bunch of swag, so I dropped that off, and then I was on my way over to a friend's house. And and what happened was, a friend of mine offered me a free Reiki treatment. Now I'd never really done Reiki. I've done some meditation, but. I was like, okay, well, if it helps me clear my mind and prepare my focus for tomorrow, great, I'll do this. So I'm looking for their house. I can't find it. I'm lost. I'm driving around circles at 1 o'clock in the afternoon on 7705. And I wake up from a coma two weeks later screaming, get me to the Rio. Wow. So you I literally, got, uh, basically, you literally were you're riding the motorcycle and then just boom, you, you don't remember anything until you get up or until you wake up like two weeks later. Correct. As a matter of fact, I don't remember that day. I had a receipt from the Rio that I'd been there and I had my swag. So I, I'd been there and I signed in, but, and I left the casino because I was, my first day of play was going to be seven, eight the next day at noon the next day. But at one o'clock on seven, seven Oh five, I got, I got, uh, I got T-boned by a Cadillac that was going about 70 miles an hour on a 35 mile an hour zone street. And it just happened to be a policeman or retired policeman, not exactly sure, but a private detective told me it was a policeman. His boss wrote and reviewed his own report, was never at the scene and worked with the guy that hit me. And the only thing the police report said was I impeded his progress, which means I got in his way. He hit me. He then skidded up. Now, this is in a 35 mile an hour zone. He hit me. He skidded 120 feet after impact. He ripped the fender bumper and hood off his car, then skidded 120 feet over the curb into the ditch in a 35 mile an hour zone. They said he wasn't speeding. It was my fault. I got in his way. I, myself, my body flew 67 feet in the air, skidded another 30 feet, wrapped myself around a pole to stop. And the car skidded past me and almost ran me over again. My motorcycle did not roll 200 feet and fall over. It slid for 200 feet, tearing up the pavement. I have police pictures from the accident scene that show this. And they said, oh, yeah, no, he wasn't speeding. And I'm like, you're crazy. So I, had three, I ended up, a long story, I ended up with three lawyers eventually 
all dropped my case because, quote, quote, there wasn't enough evidence. And the city of Las Vegas did not want me to. Uh, the city of Las Vegas said they were going to ruin the lawyer's uh, practice if they filed this case. They told it to three separate lawyers, scared the shit out of them so bad that all three dropped my case. So I never got to take it to court. I never got to fight this. I You only have two years to file. I ended up losing it. Because so you, so basically so you basically you ended up in the hospital for two weeks you were knocked out in a coma you didn't get any compensation from it and then oh no I, this I, this sounds I, bad bad enough but then on top of it you actually end up missing the main event of the WSOP and I think you didn't get your you didn't get your money back either right okay well let, let me tell you I wake up two weeks later screaming get me to the Rio. I'm in ICU for over two months. I am in a wheelchair for over two years because I have to have, I have 16 screws in my neck and I, I have, uh, I had to have six bone grafts before I could put any weight on my leg. So I end up with 600,000 in medical bills, 540,000 that my insurance didn't cover because my insurance had to cover this. You can't sue the guy because if he, if he, if I win, he files bankruptcy. Lawyers don't get paid. We went after the city for collusion, and uh, three lawyers took it and dropped it. And uh, I never got a dime out of it. Now the World Series, I'm in ICU for two months. The trolls from Two Plus Two are going crazy. And here's a part of the story that is really bizarre that I ha I, I have to admit. Uh, because it did happen, but I had no, I, I myself had no, uh, influence in it happening because my, my friends in Las Vegas were all more from, you know, my friends from Las Vegas came to the hospital because I was on my deathbed. Nobody in 23 hours, nobody had the sense to call the Rio and say, I'm not going to make it. So a friend of mine who lived in Los Angeles came to Las Vegas. He drove up there. Now, I had been in the hospital now for 24 hours. It was 1 o'clock in the afternoon on 7805. My chips went into play on 7805 at noon. He showed up an hour later to the hospital room and asked the pink elephant, white elephant question, what happened to Keith's seat? Did anybody get his 10,000 back? Everybody looked at him like they were shocked he would even ask that question. He, he understands poker well enough that he called the Rio and said, hey, this guy probably isn't going to make it. Can you take his money down? They said, no, his chips are in play. His chips go through the system. If he doesn't show up, he's just out. Now, my friend, who, who he's a good poker player. I should say he was. He has passed away. He was a pretty good poker player. I don't know if he's World Series qualified, but he, was, he knew poker. He knew enough to call the Rio, and they said, sorry. So he doesn't look anything like me. He's three inch, two inches taller than me, short, curly hair. I don't know if you can see the video, but I have long, straight hair. I've had long hair virtually my whole life. Um, he takes my ID, goes to the Rio. He hands them my ID. They look at him and say, what happened to your hair? And he, he, looked at the, he said he looked at the lady. He was wearing sunglasses. I looked at the lady and said, Oh, my mom said if I'm going to be on TV, I need to cut my hair. Now, he's three hours late. It's three o'clock in the afternoon. They put him in my seat. He sits down in my seat. Now, like I said, I'm in a coma. I've got no decision-making quality. You know, the, the Rio, I blame the Rio for not like looking at the ID and saying you're not him. They put him in my seat. <clears throat> he catches a couple no-brainer full houses, busts a couple people, and all of a sudden, he's up near the chip lead with my name. 
all of a sudden Keith Kozar, who on MySpace people are saying is on his deathbed for the last 24 hours in Las Vegas. There's mass, and I'm not, I'm not like a celebrity or anything, but there were a lot of people sending, you know, prayers and Keith Coe has been accident, almost dead. And, and all of a sudden the trolls kick in going, if he's almost dead, why is his name going up the leaderboard? Which is a very legitimate question. So the trolls jump on my friends going, why is his name on the leaderboard at the World Series of Poker? Very, very good question. Well, if you go back to the archives, Keith Kozar, K-O-Z-A-R, and my nickname was Quasar, K-W-A-Z-A-R. If you go on 2 Plus 2 from July 2005, way back in the archives, there's about a 30-page thread, why is Keith's name going up the leaderboard? And it lasts for weeks because it took them two weeks to figure out I was really in the hospital. Now, here's the end result. My friend Vags, he shows up the next morning, sits down, opens his bag, sets the tape, sets, you know, sets up, and one of the, somebody calls, somebody calls the Rio, probably one of the trolls. I don't know, and says there's an imposter in my seat. They come up to him. They ask for my ID, his, you know. He says it's in the car. He leaves and just leaves. He doesn't come back. He, I get blinded off. I get blinded off like I should have done on, on on one day one, but I get blinded off on day two. Ah, so so here's this is the conundrum that's that I so when when I have gone to try to get my money back, this part of the story has never come up. It really happened, but I can't get past. Hey, I I bought in and never got to play a hand. You took three and a half million off the top of the tournament. Can I get a seat? I'm a great ESPN story. The answer is no. And it's been no since 2005. And they have never heard that somebody actually sat in for a few hours in my seat. They've never even heard that. They still say no. Yeah. And, and so that's the, the, so the guy who jumped in and sat in, in, in your seat, you didn't send him there because you were in a coma. So he just decided right. to, to some basically steal your ID and jump in. He, he at my mother was there. My mother, I was literally on my deathbed. There, I, I had died twice up to that point. And for the first two weeks in a coma, they said there's, they don't know if I'm going to live or not. My internal injuries were so bad that I probably was going to die. Wow. And then, um, one of the questions too that we just got into it's about that. So um, again, Alexander Lacoste he says, "If you were on your deathbed, how are you alive now?" And it sounds like basically it's one of those scenarios where you know I used to. So I used to work in um, hospitals a lot, and you would have cases where you know somebody comes in, and the doctors are saying, "Hey, you know this guy may not make it." It sounds like you were kind of in that case where they said, "You know we don't know if he's going to make it, but they're doing their best." And ultimately, you did come out of it. Uh, alive, but you know, your family and your friends, they, they all, did the doctors kind of tell them, Hey, this guy might, might, yeah. you know, he they, could die they, they were telling my, my mother flew out immediately and they were, they were telling her for two weeks I could die at any moment. Well, my friend from Los Angeles who showed up asked her, can I take his ID and try to get his money back? And what he was hoping is he could get my 10 grand back or jump in and min cash. He was hoping to min cash. He didn't expect to go all the way, but he was hoping to. And I'm just like, I was in a coma. I, I, there, there's nothing I could do or say about this. I had no control over it. Yeah. Now, now the trolls went crazy. And, uh, what ended up happening was somebody finally, started calling the hospitals in Las Vegas. This is like a long time, many, many, many days after my accident. They're still running on 2 plus 2. You know, how do, how is this possible that they're still saying he, he's on his, he could die at any moment? 
Uh, and uh, finally, somebody literally called all the hospitals and they found me. And you can see the whole thread change when they found me. Now, later on, it took me a couple of years to even know about this thread. I didn't even know about it. And then I went on there. I'm like, oh, my God. So I just typed in a little message saying, hey, that's me. Guess what? I know. <laughs> I know. I know what you guys did. You're a bunch of assholes. But, uh, you know, <laughs> it took me a couple of years to find that thread. But if you Google my name and two plus two, it'll come up or it used to. I don't know. I haven't Googled it in several years, but uh, it used to come up as an archive thread. And um, Joe Pialino from um, – he's on the, the YouTube stream. He's got a question. He says, are you still mad at the 2 plus 2 trolls, and do you have a plan to get revenge on them? No, no. You know, the, the funny thing about trolls is that they're really just wasting time. They, they, you know, most of them aren't malicious. They're just, like, trying to have fun. Yeah, I like to have fun. But, you know, I'm not going to waste my time trying to, you know, disrupt a group online, you know. It's just not me. So I, I don't care about the trolls. I was really pissed off at the guy who uh, tried selling my seat. Yes, I was very pissed off at him. But I have, you know, trolls are trolls. I just ignore them for the most part. But they were so bad, I literally had to shut down the second largest group. And they were like high five, you know, uh, internet high fiving each other in the two plus two group that they got my group shut down. Yeah. That's so the, you're. That they, after you get out of the hospital, right? So you you go over to the Rio to try to get your your buy in back, right? Well, the first thing I, I, I was in ICU at UMC Hospital in Las Vegas for two months. When I got out, I, I got back to Los Angeles, and now uh, it, it was it's it's a long story, but I really you know all my resources I. The, the guy who got, he got me out of my lease. So I, all my shit was in storage. I didn't even have an apartment. I had to sleep on people's couches for a couple of weeks till I could get another apartment. Uh, like I said, my insurance, I, all of a sudden I've got 540,000 medical bills. It's going to be sell everything. I, I had to go into protective mode, but you know, a few days home, I finally tracked down the person. His name's Howard Greenbaum. It, many people in the industry have told me he's a complete prick. Howard Greenbaum was vice president of Harris Incorporated or Caesars Incorporated, whatever it is or was. And he's vice president of specialty gaming in charge of the World Series of Poker. I finally talked to enough people to get up to his level, to get to his uh, you know, uh, phone. I got him on the phone. And I told him my story. And like I said, I never told him that somebody sat in. I just told him, look. I, I just got out of the hospital. I've been in ICU. I went to your tournament. I I supported your tournament. I paid ten thousand dollars to get into your tournament. Because realistically, I could have sold that ten thousand dollar ticket. I could have sold it and uh, kept the money. But I I used the ten thousand dollars to support their tournament, the World Series of Poker. And you know, I went there. And it basically is ruining my life. I'm going to be in a wheelchair for a couple of years. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even sure if I'm going to be able to walk. I may lose my leg. Uh, my leg was mangled. It still is. Uh, they should have cut it off. But uh, I, I have severe problems with my leg, with, with circulation nerve damage, because my leg was crushed. Uh, but Howard Greenbaum, but he never even heard the story that somebody sat in my seat. Who was blinded out anyway? I got blinded off. It just didn't happen on day one. But he never even heard that. He said, no, sorry, can't help you. Your money went out of the prize pool. Okay, fine. Whatever. About a year goes by. Call him back. Hey, the World Series is coming up. Listen, I'd really love to play. Uh, you know, I'm a great ESPN story. I'm in a wheelchair from your tournament, the result of your tournament. Nothing. No, sorry, can't help you. A couple years go by. Uh, I, I tried every year for a couple years, and Howard Greenbaum just kept saying no. <clears throat> so, I literally lost my career in the film industry. 
I had to sell everything. I don't know if you can see this video of me on here. Uh, you know, there, there is a video window here. I don't know if it's online, but I got like two, two wall hanger cheap guitars hanging on the wall. I play guitar. I like, you know, I like guitars. I had 38 guitars when I got run over because, like I said, I was doing really well before my accident. Well, I ended up having to sell 30, 33 or 34 of them just to pay my bills over the next several years because I couldn't work. I was in a yeah. wheelchair. I lost my career. I lost everything. And that's actually one of the one of the questions. So Mr. S asked, did you sue? Um, and we talked about this a little bit before, but I think you were saying ultimately you weren't able to get a case filed. Right. I, I, I've hired three lawyers individually. I hired one. He said, you know, the city doesn't want to file it. He dropped it. I hired another one. Same thing. He dropped it. I hired another one from Los Angeles that could that could uh, operate in Nevada. And they told him they would ruin his California license and his Nevada license if he filed this. And he dropped it. Those were the words he said. He, he, he said the city of Las Vegas said they would ruin his license. And I never got to file, no. But I did try. I did want to sue him. I think just just the police report and the photos from the crime scene is all the evidence I would have needed. And uh, but no, I got nothing. I, I got a bill for five hundred forty thousand, and uh, you know, sell everything. And the the director for uh, the the World Series. Did you ever meet him in person, or was this all kind of phone calls and uh, and okay. and kind of? All right. Well, <clears throat> so. I, 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 w I couldn't do my career. I was dependent upon people help. Now I was trying to make a living. I was trying to support myself in a hundred dollar buying game at commerce in a wheelchair. I mean, literally in, roll in on a wheelchair, buying for a hundred dollars, play Uber super tight. And hopefully I could triple to quadruple make leave with three or 400 bucks. If I got to three or $400, I would leave. And I, I did it. I actually kind of survived. I booked, I, I have personally booked 21 winning years in a row. Uh, ironically, last year was my first losing year. In, uh, and the reason for that was I just didn't get in the hours and everybody and their mother hit sets against me. I win a bunch of little pots. When a big pot came, boom, I lose it all. It's crazy. Uh, yeah. And that's one of the things too, when, even when you're, you're playing a relatively tight game, it's sometimes tough to, to be able to fold when, you know, your opponent hits their set, but you have something like top pair, top kicker, two pair, Oh yeah. especially when two. you're playing, you know, if you're, you're playing probably, were you playing one, two, no limit or. Yeah. Yeah. I was playing one, two, no, or yeah. One, two, no limit yeah. of commerce for a hundred dollar buy -in, And I was trying to survive and I actually did it for several years. But, I mean, it was tough. It was real tough because I was in and out of the hospital. Every three or four months, I'd have to have another surgery on my leg, another bone graft. So I was constantly in and out of the hospital. Every week, I had to go to the hospital, and every three or four months, I'd have another bone graft. Wow. And you basically, now, you made your living you essentially just kind of as you could, just grinding the one-two game to, to try to make enough to survive and pay, pay the bills, right, essentially. Exactly. Plus, I was selling stuff. I, I, ha I, I actually had some really nice stuff. I had 38 guitars. I had, you know, muscle car. I had a bunch of stuff that was worth money. I eventually had to sell virtually everything. And I, I was living out of, you know, like six suitcases, renting rooms, living out of six suitcases and a couple guitars left by the time I finally got a job. Now, here's the kicker about the job. In 2003, we, we would play in these home games. I actually ran a couple home games and uh, uh, one of the guys who played in our home game, he came over as a guest of a friend of mine. Uh, uh, what ended up happening was he had got a job at the world poker tour. He was one of the first people there. He, he worked like year two season two and his name is Alex author And he was the guy that saw all the whole cards. And we all just went, ooh, ah, Alex, oh, my God, if you ever quit your job, I, you know, I want to come there, just watch and see what these whole cards are, these pros. And uh, we, we all ogled over it. Well, in 2005, Alex 
uh, I think it was 2005, Alex, uh, uh, he was the first contestant on Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? He won it. He won a half a million dollars. He, he went to like third or fourth place in a World Poker Tour event, won about 200000 Then he went to the World Series. You know, I think it's 2000. Was it 2005? I, I can't remember exactly what year. Anyway, in one year, he went to the World Series and came in like uh, 40th place for $300,000. He, he won almost a million dollars in one year, and he quit. And a friend of ours that was from the home game, her name's Mandy, uh, she ended up getting the job. And that was like before my accident, I believe. I, I, the timeline's really, really weird. Well, in 2008, I ran into Mandy and her, her boyfriend at the time. And we were in a home game and she said, are you working? No. Would you like to learn how to be an editor? And I'm like, oh, my God, yes. Because I can sit down. I can sit on my ass. I, I mean, I'm fresh out of a wheelchair. I'm walking, but I have a, a cane, a walker. I mean, I, I'm not walking very well, but I'm walking. But this is uh, like uh, four years after my accident, almost four years after my accident. And I got hired by the World Poker Tour. I, I believe it was the summer of 2009. And, and so you're, what's your role now? So with the, the World Poker Tour role that you're in, what, what do you do specifically? Well, I, I'm an associate producer, a segment producer. Uh, I'm the guy that sees all the whole cards. I've been doing that for 10 years. I'm the guy that makes database pages for every hand at a final table. I will fly to a tournament. I will write down everything that happens at a tournament. I will, uh, you know, who bets, who folds, who wins a hand, how many chips they bet, if they use time extensions now, uh, you know, when people get busted, I write down the hand number. I, I just make a page for every hand. And then when I come back to Hollywood after the tournament is over, I make a PDF. We have special software that will actually show the cards and everything else. So I'll make a PDF hand of every hand from the final table. And then I will go through with the producers on which hand should make the show. Sometimes I, I give them my, my edit list of which should make the show. Ah, uh, I see. So basically when you guys do the broadcast for, for the WPT on the show, you know, you don't really, I guess, want to show the hands where, you know, one guy raises under the gun and everybody just folds cause it's kind of boring. So you guys look for the stuff that's a little bit more exciting and has more action to show. Is that kind of how well, it works? Uh, usually a final table, I've been doing it for 10 years. Usually a final table has between 170 and 200 hands. Normally, sometimes we'll get a hundred hand final table. Sometimes we'll get 350. rarely, but normally it's around 200 hands out of the 200 hands, about a hundred to 110 of them will actually be shown. So we're eliminating about half of them. Right. And uh, so you're looking for the oh, stuff that's that's going to be the most well, exciting for people to watch or. Yeah, we, we get rid of the chaff. I mean, if somebody raises under a gun, everybody falls. Yeah, that's 95 percent. That's never making show unless it's good audio going on. There's somebody's telling a good story. Uh, but that is part of what I do. Another part is. But like I said, I'm the guy that sees all the whole cards now in 2008. Or nine when I got hired, 2009. Uh, I also did what's called logging, meaning all the footage that came in comes in and into an Avid system for editing. Now the Avid is the, where the actual footage is stored that you can pull up on a computer and watch it. And uh, you you actually cut it on the Avid machine to. Uh, you cut the footage to make the show, but the avid, the files need to be named. So every time somebody presses record and then they play, press stop, say on day one, day two, day three, we're running around the casino filming people, interviewing people, showing, you know, filming hands. We're constantly hitting record and hitting stop all day long. And we're burning up tapes and these tapes come back. They all get 
filtered into the AVID system. And as a logger, the, the poker players on the screen, we would file the name, you know, we would log everything that goes on. Like, uh, you know, Daniel Negrano doubles up off Gus Hansen or whatever it is on day two, you know, it just, uh, uh, whatever the clip is, I had to log it and say what it was. And that way, when the producers go to find certain stories, they can type in Daniel Negreanu and everything that Daniel Negreanu's tagged in will come up for that show. So uh, we, we have, you know, thousands and thousands of clips per show. So I was doing logging and the database when I first started. Now, I'm very grateful to the World Poker Tour that gave me this opportunity. They started me at 10 bucks an hour. Now, I, I, I don't care. I, I'll talk about money. I don't care. They started me at 10 bucks an hour, but you know what? It was $10 an hour. I wasn't paying to go to school to learn this. So I was getting paid to go to school. In the, the next year I worked, it was $11 an hour. The next year I worked, it was $12 an hour. Now I was in the union at this point, the editor's union. Technically, I wasn't editing, but I was, I had to be in the union for this in Hollywood. This is a legitimate union. And somehow they're getting away with paying me almost nothing. I, I can't afford to live at this rate. So I, I was screaming at the union going, how are you letting these people pay me so little? Because I'm not the same guy they hired three years ago. I can't live on this. I mean, I can't survive on Twelve dollars an hour, and uh, I finally had to threaten to quit to get a real raise. But I thank the World Poker Tour for bringing me on. And see what happened was in what 2011, you had Black Friday. Uh, and for those yeah. who who don't know, and, and a lot of folks in who are newer to poker maybe don't remember, but Black Friday, we're not talking about the day after Thanksgiving when everybody goes out to the mall. We're talking about the day that the United States attorney, I think it was for the Southern district of New York, basically shut down online poker in the U S he, he filed um, indictments against stars against a couple of other groups. And basically that was right. sort of the death of online in America. The, the U S government killed online poker. And uh, that's when full tilt was, was exposed as a Ponzi scheme where they didn't have enough money. They only had five or six million in, in their account. And when they everybody made a run, they say, cash me out, because U.S. players could not play on these sites. You know, uh, they had to pay out $180 million, and they only had six million in the bank. So right. that was Chris Ferguson, Howard Lederer, uh, Bit, uh, what's his name, uh, Bittar. Uh, well, you know they had a conference call. And, you know, they talked about it like, hey, if we all give 10, 15, 20 million back, we, we can pay, start paying people back and, you know, make maybe make it run out. So where it, it'll look like, oh, God, you know, our money's tied up and we're having problems paying people back. But no, they just said, screw them. We're not paying these poker players. We're just keeping all the money. We're not we're not we're shutting the doors, locking it up. And yeah. that that is why Howard Leder and Chris Ferguson. It's shocking they weren't dragged out in the desert and taking care of Vegas old style. I'm serious. I, it blows my mind that people let them get away with that for so long. Well, there's still there's still a lot of people that they when you know Chris Ferguson kind of made his comeback to the poker world. There's a lot of people that they still hate the guy. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Well, so one question that just came in. So Joe Joe Palino asked. Um, so he mentioned, didn't you have 800k in hospital bills? So what what did you end up doing with those bills that you had? Okay. Uh, the, the final bill that my insurance did not pay was $540,000. Uh, here in America, I don't know where you're at, but, uh, I mean, I mean, not <laughs> New Hampshire. So, right. Now I'm just talking to your general public here. If you're in a different country, you know, they, uh, they may treat it different ways, but they cannot here in America, they cannot, uh, they, I didn't have to file bankruptcy. What I had to do was default on the bills, meaning I paid what I could and then I stopped paying. And 
they couldn't come after me for my car and you know actually i i'd already sold so much that i didn't have anything left but they they legally couldn't come after me basically i had to what's called default on my on my bills which is virtually the same as filing bankruptcy because it stays on your credit for six to seven years uh that story will come in in a minute but i ruined my credit over this and i didn't pay the bill and uh, you know i was just struggling and juggling and when i was working for the world poker tour the first couple of years i was struggling and juggling i mean i was making 10 bucks an hour i had to play poker in a hundred to two hundred dollar buying game at commerce and try to survive and i did it i mean i was renting rooms i was asking people for help now you the question you asked before is did i ever show up to the world series yes 2009 <laughs> now the, you know what this was right before i got the job with the world poker tour literally days before i got the job so it was 2009 it was the first year of the november night and uh, Jeffrey Pollock was the tournament director. Jeffrey Pollock, I got, oh, I went to Vegas. I showed up. I got him. I showed him all my paperwork, newspaper article, police report, uh, hospital bill, my buy-in receipt. I showed him everything. And I said, look, I'm a great ESPN story. Uh, I just want my chance. You know, just, just please buy me back in. I just want my chance. He said, I'll check into this. Here's my email. Send me an email. I'll, I'll, I'll see what I can do. Now, this is June 1st. The, fi the main event doesn't start till around July 1st. It's a full month ahead of time. I drove back to Los Angeles, and that's when I got the offer for the job with the World Poker Tour. So, uh, you know, July came and went. I never heard anything. Je Jeffrey Pollock never got a hold of me. The November 9, the first one, came and went. Nothing. Dis around December 1st, I get an email from Jeffrey Pollock saying, I'm going to look into this. By January 1st, I believe he had been ousted from the World Series of Poker. He was fired. So, no, he, he didn't get a chance to look into this, or he didn't try very hard. Uh, but that was my first in where I showed up and I got rejected. Now, in 2012, they had they had a little tournament at the World Series of Poker called the One Drop. It was a million dollars buy-in. I'm working at the World Poker Tour. My boss, the person, our commentator, Mike Sexton, min cashes for 1.1 million. I show up, to, I, I, now I, I didn't plan on any of this, but I just happened to be in Vegas then. Now, up to now, I'd, I've been boycotting the World Series of Poker, refusing to play in anything at the Rio, anything to do with them. You know, I'm not giving them a nickel. They should have, you know, they took three and a half million off the top. They should have given me my seat back. So, um, Ty Stewart was the, 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 uh, tournament director at that time ty stewart uh he uh he's coming to meet me somewhere and again i have all my paperwork i have the police report i have pictures i got you know hospital bills i've got everything ty stewart's coming and here comes mike sexton mike sexton walking down the hall with about 10 people now he just min cash for 1.1 million now Somebody bought him, and he wrote a book. Somebody bought him in the tournament, but he was going to split the proceeds of, of the 100 whatever thousand over the million. He's going to give the million back and, and split the proceeds. So they're standing there waiting to get paid. I said, Mike, you've heard my story. You know me for many years now. I've been working with you. Could you please tell Ty Stewart they should put me in? Mike is the poker ambassador. Mike Sexton spins around in a circle and wanders off. Doesn't say anything, just wanders off. Five minutes go by. All his crew that 
his investors of a million dollars who are waiting to get paid are standing around going, they're, we're literally near the cashier window waiting for Mike to get paid. He's gone. He, you can't see him. He's, he's disappeared down a hallway at the Rio. So Ty Stewart shows up. I give him all my paperwork. I tell him, you know, this is my story. I told him Howard Greenbaum's a douchebag and that, you know, I really would like to play. You know, I got my start at the Rio. I would love to play. He leaves with my paperwork, comes back 10 minutes later and says, we have already paid you back. I went ballistic. I started screaming, you're a fucking liar. I want proof. You need to show me the video. You need to show me a receipt. You paid me $10,000. You're a bunch of lying fucking assholes. And he looked at me and said, Howard said we paid you back. Howard, Lee, uh, Howard Greenball said we paid you back. I freaked out. I started screaming at him. Uh, and uh, a security guard just happened to be standing near Mr. Stewart because he probably brought him with him. And uh, they decided to escort me out of the Rio. And I kept trying to turn around screaming, I want to see the video. You have to show me the video. And I tried getting back to Ty Stewart and the security guard is manhandling me, pushing me out the door. And when the door shut, he was standing outside with me outside the Rio. And he said, guess what? Don't come back. And I said, don't worry, I won't. I'm never coming back. Unless you buy me into the World Series of Poker, I'm not ever coming back. And I'm boycotting you, and I'm going to trash you every chance I get within reason. That was in 2012. I have never been back into the Rio since. Um, now, you talk about poker ambassadors. Can I tell you about poker ambassadors? Yeah, so so let's talk about this. So first, kind of what is a, a poker ambassador? Poker ambassador is somebody who supposedly is good for the game of poker. They have a great reputation, and they they chant the, the praises of different poker rooms and different uh, – uh, they champion for poker all things good. And – if somebody does get slighted or a poker room has a bad reputation, they will go in and actually supposedly, you know, try to make things right. And there are several very big, big self-proclaimed poker ambassadors. One of them is the person who won the 2005 World Series of Poker, the one that I didn't get to play because I was in a coma. His name is Joe Hashem. Joe Hashem has actually argued with Daniel Negreanu online about who is a better poker ambassador. And Joe Hashem says, I'm the better poker ambassador over Daniel Negreanu, who everybody says is a great poker ambassador. Uh, guess what? Joe Hashem has heard my story. Do you know what Joe Hashem has done? He has ignored me. I'm not asking for a nickel from Joe Hashem. I'm not asking for a nickel from Mike Sexton. I'm not asking a nickel from Daniel Negreanu. I'm not asking a nickel from Phil Hellmuth, these major poker ambassadors. I'm asking them to go tell Harris, Caesars, Inc., whoever these people are anymore, tell them, guess what? This guy deserves a chance. He, he gave his body and... Uh, you know, lost everything because he went to support the Rio. He had an opportunity and he, he got run over by a car and never got a chance. He almost died. So all these guys have heard my story. As a matter of fact, I'll be working with Phil Helmuth tomorrow. I told Phil Helmuth, Hey, we're bookends. You have the most success at the world series of poker. I have the least success. Yeah. I bought it and, and hey, never got Here's to a, here's a question too from, from Mr. S. So he's asking, why do you suppose you were being ignored by everyone? Uh, I don't matter. I'm not a poker name. I'm not, you know, I'm not an entity. Uh, you know, so you think I, if this happened to somebody like uh, a Helmuth or an Ivy, somebody oh, really well known that, that it would have been treated differently. You know what? Uh, uh, what's his name from Canada? Uh, Jonathan Duhamel. He lost his bracelet. They made him a new one. I mean, Somebody stole his bracelet. They made him a new one. It's like they, they I, when they started doing 
quote, quote, multiple starting days at like day 1A, day 1B, day 1C at the Rio. Yep. There was so much confusion. People would show up on day 1C, but their their chips went into play on day 1B. And guess what they did? They gave them chips. They put them in the game. You know, th- th- there's a lot of people who, who have been put back in the game. Um, there's a lot of people who have, you know, lost their opportunity and got it back. Now, as for someone like me, like I said, I'm not asking for a nickel. I've had people want to do a GoFundMe. They've wanted to film it as a documentary. No, I'm not supporting the real. I'm not supporting Harris. I'm not giving them a nickel. I don't want to GoFundMe. I want Harris. I want Caesars Inc., whoever they are. I want them to put me in because they know they should have. That's why they lied and told me they paid me back. You know, they, they said, well, we paid you back. No, you did. You should have, but you didn't. As a matter of fact, right now, if you show up to the Rio and you missed your day one, you'll get your 10,000 back because everybody now has one opportunity to miss a, a starting date and they will refund your money. Guess why? People like me. I'm probably not the only one. I've heard other horror stories where, uh, you know, a, a guy was a, a, a guy was there and uh, I guess his wife had a heart attack and he just got on a plane and went home. And I don't know if he ever got his money back or not, but, you know, it happens a lot. Yeah, or if, people who, like, are flying into Vegas, right? You could have your flight get delayed or canceled or, or whatever the case might be and not even make it on time. Right. But right. the point is it's happened more than just me. It's just, you know, I, I end up having a dramatic story because A, I work in the film industry and B, you know, I work for the World Poker Tour and, uh, you know, I, I almost died. I mean, I was literally in a wheelchair for several years. I couldn't yep. put any weight on my leg. I was non-bearing, weight-bearing for several years. And yeah. it took me it took me a good solid, you know, five or six years before I stopped using a cane. And, you know, it's been 14 years now. I'm probably going to have to start using a cane again because my leg hurts every day. Yeah. Um, so then, so basically, so after that, you've never played a WSOP event um, and you're working with the WPT now. What do you see happening kind of for the future of the World Poker Tour? Where do you see it going in the next few years? All right. Well, I, I've been with the World Poker Tour now for 10 years and there's a lot of changes here that have been coming down the road and you know i'm not going to pull any punches here but the world poker tour who's now the very top people adam pliska they're doing great somewhere in the middle somebody is screwing this up the people who do uh the the people who do my job you know the the editing or i don't do editing but make the tv show amazing we're way more than professional. We do stuff, you know, we, we make a Toyota look like a Ferrari. I mean, we make this show look good. The people who shoot the final table, the people who are there, like, miking everybody, and they got the big cameras up on the cranes flying around and overheads, and those people are wonderful. Somebody booking the tournaments is screwing up. I don't know who it is. I, 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 I you know, I can't name names, but... Somehow, somebody decided that, hey, guess what? We're not going to put a million dollars on the table anymore. There's no more cash on the table at the World Poker Tour. When, when you see the World Series of Poker main event, and it gets down to final two, they put $8 million on the table. Yeah. That, add, that adds pressure. That You're seeing the money. Oh, my God. You're seeing what you're playing for. I used to go to the World Series of Poker in the 90s and watch it, and I would marvel that there would be a couple hundred thousand on the table. And, and then Linda Johnson, when they, somebody won, she grabbed 10,000 out of the pile and say, you're playing in the main event, right, right, right? And the guy goes, yeah. She, she'd run across the room waving $10,000 going, look, look, we're, we got another entry into the main right. event. And, and, and when you're watching on, you know, when you're watching on TV, right, so it just kind of looks cool to see that much money because – most people don't get to see that much money piled up somewhere, right? Most people watching, they're going to be middle-class folks and 
you know, for them, if they saw a stack of five thousand dollars, that's a lot of money, let alone millions and millions of dollars. Right, and and and, and we used to stack what the winner was going to get on the table for many, many years. And a couple of years ago, somebody just made a decision. We don't need to do that anymore. It's so like, you think oh. that, that in the next few years, the, the world purgatory is going to see its kind of viewership um, end up falling or. Oh, no, no. Well, I'm just saying that people who make these decisions, uh, they don't understand the nuances of poker. They don't understand that seeing a million dollars or two million dollars right next to you and saying, if I can beat this person, that's mine, the pressure that creates. So somebody who's in charge do, making those decisions, to me, is where this company's about to jump the shark. And now here's, here's the biggest problem. Those people who are making these decisions somehow can't keep our tournaments anymore and it's killing me we have lost hang on we have lost bay 101 five diamond legends montreal uh we we've lost everything in europe uh their decisions has caused us to lose five diamond other than the world series of poker five diamond was next at the, at the Bellagio first place was usually well over $2 million. Yeah. Lately it's still been $2 million. Guess what? You show up, there's no cameras. They're not filming. Our names attached to it, but nobody's filming. Right. And the, by the way, the, uh, the, this is, the, this might seem like a random question here, but are you going to be out at the, um, the Borgata in Atlantic city during the WPT coming up or. Guess what? We're not filming it. Oh, it's, wow. it's, piss, it's pissing me off. I went to every, I was going to all the televised tournaments. I still do. But the problem is, is we're not filming it. No, I won't be there. Uh, wow. I, I, didn't, I, I didn't realize that. I thought, I thought they would, they would our be filming name, that one. Our, our name is attached. Now they may film poker. Go may go in and film the final table, but we're not putting it on Fox sports on Sunday nights at eight o'clock every Sunday night. We got a new show, but guess what? We're not putting it on Fox Sports and saying, here's Borgata, day one, day two, day three, getting to the final table and telling all the stories of the players. Players show up to poker tournaments that are televised because they're trying to build their brand. They're trying to get fame. They want the recognition. They want to be a part of the poker community. They want to be known. And they show up to a tournament that, the Five Diamonds been there 16 years in a row. It was the biggest and best tournament in the World Poker Tour history. And guess what? We're not filming it. Wow. And, la and last year, we had a record-breaking over 1,000 players pay $10,000 to get in the Five Diamond tournament, and we didn't film it. We've lost Legends. Legends was an original tournament. Uh, we've lost Bay 101. That was the funnest tournament of any because it was a shooting star with bounties. Now, Matt Savage, who is the tournament director for the World Poker Tour, he is his home casino is Bay 101. How can Matt Savage have his home casino, the Bay 101, and Bay 101 and the World Poker Tour not be able to negotiate a contract to film the tournament we filmed 15 years in a row. How is that possible? Somebody in upper management at the World Poker Tour, it's mind-boggling. You can't get a contract. So I don't know what's going to happen with the future of the World Poker Tour, but season 18... I just we just finished season 17. Se season 18 is uh, already underway with a bunch of non-televised tournaments, but we do not have one tournament so far. That we're going to film until January, where we used to start September 1st or even earlier. We we used to do Choctaw in August, middle yeah. of August, and that was the first tournament of our season. 
Before that, it was Legends, and then we added Chalk Town. It would start in the middle of the summer. But that was the start of the season. And we would televise tournaments like every month or every other month. We'd at least do one, one or two. And uh, we don't have a tournament to film till January, mid-January. Wow. Uh, and speaking of tournaments, um, one of our one of our viewers, Puck, he said, ask Keith if he thinks Hendon Mob is legit and essential to tournament players. Are you familiar with that site? Yeah. Uh, I love Hendon Mob. I use Hendon Mob every day. Unfortunately, there's about 15 tournament results of mine that have not shown up on Card Player or Hendon Mob. Now, I'll be honest. They are very, they're very they're both Card Player and Hendon Mob are very thorough. They've got They've got uh, a lot of problems where if somebody's name is misspelled, I found my name misspelled a couple times for caches. I've had them change it. Uh, but they've missed about 10, 15 caches. I should have caches yeah. going all the way back to the 90s. But uh, in that's reality... A, you know, that's the thing you know, with their, their tech platform. Probably when they get names that don't get the right exact spelling, it probably creates either two records or something, and then they right. have to figure out how to, how to merge them. Um, yeah. And I actually have the same problem as you, where I've got caches, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in caches that are not on Hendon Mob, they're not on uh, GPI. And what I found is that the problem is, is that you've got some of these poker rooms that they just don't send their results in, or right. um, up well, in New Hampshire, you had a contingent of people that they didn't want the results sent in because they were afraid that basically the IRS was going to hunt them down because they they failed to actually report their winnings to pay taxes. And they right. were afraid that the, uh, you know, the feds were going to go peruse Hendon Mob and find out, oh, this guy cashed for two thousand dollars and he didn't pay us, and now they're going to, you know, bust down his door or whatever. Yeah, well, um, Hendon Mob and Car Player are doing fantastic jobs, but sometimes they'll get double names. Meaning, I, I, I think I found Bruce Kramer was listed in two different ways, the same spelling, but he had results in two different like profiles of himself where it was the same guy. It just, they just needed to merge that all. Now they've been working on that, but it's not hand and mob or card players fault. It's the casino's fault for not sending that information properly to them. Cause if they send it to them, they'll eventually get it up. Usually pretty quick, you know, yeah. within a few days. And I love hand and mob. I use it every day for work. I, I use hand and mob and card player almost literally every day researching players that we're doing stories on people of one, you know, if somebody makes it to like fifth place, I mean, we have to have all their stats. So we go to hand and mob and you know, they've got a stats page. It's incredible. And Mr. Uh, SS, is that common that results don't get posted? I think we just talked about that a little bit, but it seems like when the rooms are not sending in the, the information that's causing. It's, and I think, you know, the only 90, way that 98% is casinos fault. Yeah, and I think the only way that that gets fixed is if people really push on the rooms they're playing tournaments in to start sending in those results, making sure that they're getting the right credit. Another question from Mr. S is, what is GPI? Um, so GPI that I, I had mentioned, it's the Global Poker Index, and they're very similar. They report out results from poker tournaments and aggregate them together so you can see a tournament player's career. Mm -hmm. It's a world poker ranking either for the year or lifetime, but usually just that year. It's, it's player of the year. Uh, yeah. GPI is just a way to, to level the playing field that somebody who wins a $1,000 stud buy-in tournament, they change a GPI to match the equivalent of somebody winning a $10,000 uh, ARIA weekly tournament. You know, it, it makes – you know, somebody gets more points for winning this tournament, less points for winning this turn, but it, it levels the playing field. All right. And then another question for Mr. S was, do results not being posted hinder people's, uh, hinder people's ability to find poker financing? And what do you think about that? Uh, you know what? I've never had poker financing. I've never looked for it. I don't, I don't deal with, uh, you know, these sites that sell pieces. I think, I think when the trolls tried stealing my seat and selling it or part of me or whatever they were trying to do, my God, I, I just, I stay away from that completely. Uh, I, I finance now I, I will sell 10% to a friend here and there, but in reality, it's somebody I'm, I'm like literally dealing with in person on the spot. I have the money in hand before I go play. I don't do it through random people online. 
Uh, ah. There's a bunch of sites that sell action, and I, I don't use them. I don't sell any. I don't buy any. Uh, that's just not a world I'm familiar with. All right. And Keith, it's been great having you on the show. Um, is there anything else that you want to you wanna touch on um, before we wrap up? Yeah. Well, so 10 years to – almost 10 years to the day, I, I go to Vegas. I play an Aria 500, which is a $560 buy-in tournament. I uh, come in 36th place. I win like nine grand. Wee, you know, that's great. I come home. I, I play in a, in a World Poker Tour deep stacks, which, hey, there's World Poker Tour type tournaments everywhere all over the place. So I, it's a $1,000 buy-in. I make a final table. I win like six, seven grand. I'm up 15,000 in like uh, 10 days. So I go to uh, buy a washer and dryer with my wife and uh, I got married a few years ago, but uh, I, I'm doing good. My leg hurts, but I'm doing well. I got my life back. I'm still struggling and juggling at times. So I am up like 15 grand. We're out looking for a washer dryer. She says, oh, Huntington Beach, Charlie's. I live in LA. It's around the corner. We, we, I go, let's go get a shirt. I mean, I'm an old scooter biker, you know, biker tramp from way back. So uh, I go in there and get a shirt. She goes, isn't that the kind of Harley you like? I said, yes, honey, it is. Well, you should go look at it. I said, I can't afford it, honey. She goes, you just won $15,000. I said, okay, I'll go look at it. I looked at it. It was two years old. They had 5,000 miles, still under warranty. They wanted 17. I looked at the guy. I said, can you come off this like 15? He said, do you have the cash? I said, yep. He said, sure. I threw her my keys. I go get my helmet. Well, yeah, almost, 10 you know, years the... <laughs> the, almost 10 years to the day, I bought another Harley. Well, that's, that's the cool thing when you, sometimes, you know, somebody's got a price and when you show them, Hey, I got the money right now, you can get a good deal. So it's yeah, good. Well, it's good that you're, you're back on the bike though. Cause that's, I mean, a lot I, of people have, would never make it back from that sort of injury. They'd be, I, I have ridden 50,000 miles, 35,000 on a Harley. Then I traded it in for a brand new Indian last year. I've got over 15,000 now and I've put over 50,000 miles in rush hour, Los Angeles traffic where we have 12 million people and 20 million cars and it is like a pinball machine out there. People are dying every day. And I tell you, there's days I go to work. I don't know how I make it out there or home, uh, but I've done it. So my accident in 2005 was an anomaly. I'm a very good rider. I put 50,000 miles in the last four years in, in rush hour traffic. I know what I'm doing, but yeah. I don't know why my accident happened. I, I, to this day, I don't remember anything. But like I said, if I want to hammer home anything about this story, I don't, you know, I'm not looking for somebody to walk up, hand me 10 grand to go play in the world series. I don't, I want the world series to recognize that they need to put me in. I went there to support their tournament and I almost died. It ruined my life for many, many years. It took me 10 years to finally quote, quote, get even again. I mean, I struggled and juggled for so long. And I still do today. But here's the greatest part of it. the final. There's in the Bible. There's a story about Job. Job had everything, and people told God, "Well, if you took, if he didn't have all that stuff, he'd he'd hate you." And jo God said, "Oh yeah, well, let's test Job," and took everything from Job. Took his his family, killed his cattle, ended up with boils and hives all over him, and the guy didn't turn against God. And God says, you know what? I'm giving you everything back tenfold. I'm giving you everything back plus, you know, way more than you had. Well, my story is kind of like Job because I have suffered for 14 years kind of juggling and struggling. And I've been making it, but it's just, it's, it's, it hasn't been easy. Right. And, uh, and uh, last, this last week, I just got an offer to be a producer on a movie. And I'm talking about this is real. This is real money. This is, you know, if this flies, I could be, I could end up being up on stage for the Oscars. This could mean millions of dollars down the road, not right now, but down the road. I'm talking about this is a real opportunity as it just fell into my lap. It's legitimate. I've already signed a deal for it for the first one. If the first one goes good, I'm done with the world poker tour. I'm going to play poker because I want to, not because I have to. I'm going to be able to go to the five diamond and say, 
all in. Um, wow. Sorry. So that is rebuy, rebuy, yeah. all <laughs> in, rebuy. Right. You can go nuts in. and just fire bullet after bullet after bullet. But I, it's been I great having you. Be, yeah, it's it's <laughs> been great um having you on the show. Thank you for telling your story. Um and by the way, folks, <laughs> if if you're interested in being on Poker Uncensored, we're obviously this is the first episode, but we're gonna have a second episode and a third and a fourth and so on. Um and so let me know if you're if you're interested. You can find me on Twitter. Um, Keith, are you on Twitter or any other social media? Or? Yeah, yeah. Twitter, I'm Quasar, K-W-A-Z-A-R. I haven't posted a whole lot, but uh, everything I post about the World Poker Tour upcoming tournaments and stuff, I don't really use it that often. Inst- Instaface, uh, Instagram, I think I'm Quasar1, K-W-A-Z-A-R1, uh, I believe. But you know, it, Facebook is Quasar, K-W-A-Z-A-R. I got all those names pretty early. So anyway, awesome. that's a well, nickname, Keith, Quasar. Awesome. Keith, thank you for joining us and have a, uh, a good rest of your evening. Um, and I'm going to continue on. Thank you. Thank you, thank Matthew. You. And everybody have a wonderful night. And just remember, play tight and you'll survive. Thank you. All right. So for our next segment tonight, we're going to talk about the newest poker room on the East Coast. That is Encore Boston Harbor, um, which was opened up by Wynn Resorts Limited back in June. Now, this was a facility that went under a several-year-long construction process. They basically had to clean up what was an industrial dumping ground. It's the largest amount of money ever spent on a single-phase construction in Massachusetts, and I've been there several times since they've opened. It is a beautiful facility. They have an amazing poker room. Uh, the landscaping is great there. The decor is great. It's got very clean air because they don't allow smoking. Um, but as I'll go into in this review, they've still got some challenges and some issues. So, you know, the poker room, when you walk into it, it sits on the second floor of um, of Encore. It overlooks the main gaming floor, which has slot machines and table games. But one of the concerns there is that it does get a little loud in there when you're sitting on those outer areas that are by the casino. And for some players, that's distracting. Other players, they can tune it out. You'll see a lot of people with headphones in the poker room, obviously, to do that like you would in any room. Another thing with the poker room, though, they've had some technical challenges. And, you know, I have heard this from many people, but the points from the poker room, which basically should be coming in as as you play in order to let you redeem them for comms like food, those are not syncing up with red card. And from what I'm hearing, and I don't have this officially from Encore, but the issue is that the system they use for red card is run by IGT. Uh, the system that they're using for poker in Boston or, or Everett, Massachusetts, is Poker Atlas. Now in Las Vegas, Wynn is using Bravo for their poker tracking. And I guess they're having technical issues actually getting the data to sync up from um poker atlas over to red card and that's a big issue because it's been going on since they opened up in june and it should have been fixed by now and so poker players aren't getting their points which is frustrating another problem is that their beverage service while it's improved since they first opened is still a little bit slow but as far as the poker tables themselves go these are beautiful tables they're well constructed they have great felts the seating is extremely comfortable and they have usba chargers at every seat the food options at encore they are amazing outside the poker room. If you're in the poker room, though, the problem is, is that the food is subpar and overpriced. Case in point, a turkey club costs $15, and it doesn't even come with any sides. And it's not that great of a club. It's about the quality of what you would get at a Subway. But overall, this is probably the best place for cash poker action in all of New England, if not the entire East Coast. And the customers have migrated from other poker rooms that are around and they're now playing an encore, and it's got great action. You can park for free during the weekdays. So that's my rundown of the new poker room at Encore. Um, we're going to take questions here from the audience. So let's see here what we've got. So the first question we have is uh, somebody had chimed in to say that they heard that more rake is better, and would you agree? So you know that's an interesting one. So Daniel Negreanu made a pretty controversial comment a while ago where he said that more rake could actually be better. And for those who don't know a lot about poker, rake is the money that the house basically takes out of every pot or that they take out uh, periodically if it's a time rake game 
and use for their own profit or their own revenue. Now, more rake tends to so more rake tends to impact the winning players the most, and that's because the winning players are the ones who are raking in pots themselves, and so the rake comes out of the pot. The losing players, well, they're not winning pots, and so therefore the rake doesn't really impact them as much. Um, and when you have a high rake scenario, that can drive away some of the better players because it eats into their margin, especially those who are playing for a living or playing professionally. And so what Negranu's point was is that more rake could actually lead to a softer game, and that means that the players who are not as skilled have a better chance to actually make some money as opposed to punting away their entire buy-in. Of course, overall, I would say the other factor that goes into it is the quality of the room and the amenities. Let's say the rake is $4 a pot at one room, and it's $5 a pot at the other, but the other room's got much nicer facilities, they've got charging stations, and they've got complimentary beverages, well then that extra dollar of rake might actually be worthwhile. Our next question comes in from Joe Palino. Joe Palino is asking, what are you wearing? So, Joe, I am currently wearing a uh, blue polo shirt from The Gap, uh, and I'm wearing uh, pants that also are from The Gap. So, there's the answer to Joe's question. So let's see if we've got any other questions that came in during the uh, episode. Remember, we're always taking questions on Twitter, Facebook, and through YouTube. So Mr. SS, will Northeast Poker Unlimited be coming out with patches, hats, etc.? Well, right now we don't have any patches. We don't have any hats. We don't have any merchandise. In the future, that might happen. And one of the things that we do need is somebody to be a graphic designer to create a really cool design for patches, hats, t-shirts, hoodies, etc. So if you've got graphic design skills, reach out to me and I'll see if we can uh, do anything. And so with that, we are going to wrap up the podcast. Um, if anybody has any final questions, put them on in. Where can you find Northeast Poker Unlimited and the Poker Uncensored podcast? Well, you can find us on YouTube. That's where we're going to have the podcast. The video will be put up for everybody to watch and play back later. And um, Oh, I have a question too. So hold on. So let me get through this first, but YouTube to find the videos. We have the Facebook group, Northeast Poker Unlimited on Facebook. You can find it and join it. It's for poker discussion focused on the Northeast, but everybody else is welcome to join regardless of where you are in the country or in the world. And then you can also find me on Twitter at Matt Solon. You can tweet me. Uh, you can send your questions in. You can beg to be a guest on the upcoming podcast. And then Let's see, another question here that came in. So um, let's see here. I've got a question of... So Joe Palino asks, do you play to win sometimes or always? So it's an interesting question. So in my poker play, you know, I am typically playing the turn, and, and this is going to be talking about tournament here. So typically when I'm playing tournament, I am playing the tournament with the goal of winning because I want first place in that tournament. Poker tournaments tend to be top heavy in the prize pool. And so you've got to play for first place. And that means, you know, if I sit down and it's the third hand of the tournament and I turn the nuts, I am not afraid to put the chips all in. Even if somebody might suck out on me on the river or, you know, pre flop, I get aces. If there's two people that ship it all in ahead of me, I am shipping it all in because I know I'm favored to win there and I'm going to try to pick up the chips and play for the win. And so that's my goal, but there's other scenarios where it doesn't actually make sense to try to play for the win. And one of those is satellites. So in a satellite, for example, let's say there's a hundred people and 10 of them are going to make it to the main tournament. They're going to get a seat. Well, if you're in 12th place and you know, you've got a strong hand and somebody puts it all in and they've got you covered, it might actually make sense to fold, right? Rather than try to win a coin toss where you might get knocked out, you could fold because you really only need two other people to get knocked out before you end up getting your ticket. Um, and so that's where it could make sense to not necessarily play for the win, but rather just play to make the money or play to not bubble out. So... And let's see if there's any other questions that came in. I'm scrolling through it right now. Let's see here. So 
Mr. Alexander Lacoste asks, what is your favorite poker hand? Um, well, that's a that's a pretty easy question. So I like the hands that are most favored to win. And that means I like pocket aces, pre-flop, obviously, because they are favored to win. You get it all in with pocket aces, you're ahead of basically anybody else, right? Even if the person has ace-king suited, they have pocket kings, you're getting your chips in good, you're favored to win, and they're drawing. Let's see if we've got any final questions here. So, Mr. SS, how many viewers are you happen to have next week? So, the podcast is actually not a weekly podcast at this point. Um, maybe in the future we will be weekly. We'll announce the dates for when the next podcast is going to be. I think the viewers are going to, you know, obviously probably beat this one once people see the podcast from this time and uh, people see that, hey, we're not afraid to take on the controversial topics. Other poker podcasts out there don't want to do it. Poker Uncensored will. Joe Palino again with another question here. So is AK just, oh, I, okay, he, he's talking about, so AK, just a drawing hand, and by AK, he means Ace King. Um, so Joe, yes, Ace King is essentially a drawing hand. Um, basically, you know, you, you've got Ace High, and usually you've got to hope to improve. So let's say you don't improve with Ace King. Well, you don't improve with Ace King, you might not have the best hand when it comes down to the showdown. And that's the uh, reality of that hand. You know, it's a strong starting hand, but it can't stand on its own in many situations. Let's see. Our next question from Mr. S again, how often will you be podcasting? We're looking at um, probably having the next podcast come in the week of the, um, probably the week of the, uh, the, Borgata Poker Open um, in early September. And then the next question here from Joe Paolino, um, how many unreported Hendon Mob results do you have? I don't have an exact count, but I do have tens of thousands of dollars of wins that didn't get reported. So we talked about with Keith, one of the big issues is these poker rooms are just not doing a good job sending the results in. And they've got a lot of ignorant players that think that you know, the feds are going to hunt around trying to find out that their little cash for, you know, $75 or $300 didn't get reported to the IRS and that the feds are going to come in busting down their doors to collect. And the reality is that's not happening. And people also probably should consider paying their taxes. That might be a good idea. And then, you know, if you pay your taxes, you don't have to worry about the feds busting your door down for tax evasion. All right. And our final question for tonight uh, is going to – actually, wait. Did we get them all? We may have hit them all. Hold on. Let's see here. Our final question for tonight – Mr. S, what is your thought on the fact that Hendon Mob doesn't report buy-ins or losses? Um, so, yeah, I actually would love to see a situation where every single poker entry by somebody gets reported in, as well as all of the cash outs and wins. But the reality is, is that they have a hard enough time getting the data of just winners. Um, and I have to imagine that some poker rooms don't even really record... Um, right now who buys in and punts <laughs> so they only really seem to care about recording the winners but it would be great if we had you know more data out there and we had a true system to be able to rank people based on not just their career winnings but career profitability because you could actually win a decent amount of money and still be a loser right so if somebody said you know what i'm gonna play 500 hundred dollar tournaments every every week and i'm gonna fire two or three bullets at each of them you might go through the entire year and spend $25,000 of buy-ins. And if you cash for $18,000, that looks cool, but you've actually lost $7,000 plus your travel expenses if you're traveling around to do this. So, well, that does it for tonight. Thank you for joining the inaugural Poker Uncensored podcast. I'm your host, Matt Solon, and everybody have a good night, and may you have good luck at the tables.